<laughs> All right, just uh, in the nick of time, uh, take Good afternoon, everyone. My name is J.P. Katungal. I'm an assistant professor here in the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice, and I'm the convener for, uh, of the Noted Scholar Series uh, in the Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to our event today featuring uh, Dr. Elliot Powell. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathering today and doing our work on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Halkomenum speaking Musqueam people. As we think today about the intertwined gender, racial, and sexual politics of impropriety, I invite us to keep top of mind how historical and ongoing uh, conditions of settler colonial white supremacist violence rests upon the calculative logic of proper and improper, of acceptable and unacceptable, of normal and abnormal. Logics to which we relate differently, but in an interlinked way, in our different positionalities and embodiments in our gathering today. On to our guest speaker. Let me introduce him via a short story set in the suburbs of Vancouver, let's say in 2004. Uh, there once was a wee queer boy, fresh out of high school, working at a Starbucks at, a time, at the time while doing his undergraduate work at Simon Fraser University. Coming from a working class immigrant family, he could not afford a cell phone, but after getting his first job and was finally able to afford one, albeit one that wasn't top of the line or high tech in any way, um, he was nevertheless happy to be able to have one that can have a customized ringtone. Uh, one of the first ringtones uh, he ever had was a MIDI version of Missy Elliott's Get Your Freak On. Uh, more specifically, the iconic six note um, uh, sonic bass uh, that I'm sure we will hear today. So fast forward 15 or so years that we little queer boy from 2004 is quite delighted to have been able to program as part of the Noted <laughs> Scholar Series, Dr. Elliot Powell. I met Dr. Powell uh, in April of this year when I attended my first ever uh, Association of Ameri Asian American Studies Conference in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Powell is assistant professor with affiliations in American Studies, Asian American Studies, and Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Minnesota. His work is primarily concerned with African American and South Asian American intercultural music making endeavors during the 20th and 21st centuries, and the ways in which um, these music-centered collaborative efforts articulate with larger socio-political formations and the complex and historically situated processes of identity formation. His book project uh, on this is titled The Other Side of Things, African American and South Asian Collaborative Sounds in Black Popular Music, under contract with U Minnesota Press, uh, which brings together critical race, feminist, and queer theories to consider the political implications of African American and South Asian collaborative music making in jazz, uh, during the 1960s and 70s and hip-hop since the 1980s. In this work, due out next year, uh, Dr. Powell argues that Afro-South Asian cultural productions constitute dynamic, complex, and at times contradictory sites of comparative racialization, transformative gender and queer politics, and anti-imperial political alliances. In addition to this work, Dr. Powell also co-edited uh, a 2019 special issue on black queer and trans aesthetics for the journal The Black Scholar. The sole special issue focused on queer and trans issues in the journal's 50 year history. His publications have also appeared in GLQ, Jazz Research Journal, the Oxford um, Handbook of Hip Hop Music, and the volume Popular Music and the Politics of Hope. Today, he will be presenting material from another book project, tentatively titled Ill Illegitimate Sounds. His talk today is titled Work It, Missy Elliott, Queer Hip Hop, and the Musical Aesthetics of Impropriety. So welcome, Dr. Elliot Powell. Mm. 
So of course, I, I want to thank JP for the sort of introduction uh, and for helping uh, solve this tech issue. Um, <laughs> I'm happy that we can finally kind of get this to, to, to work. Um, uh, I also want to thank Anne-Marie for doing all of the kind of sort of logistical things and helping me also get here. Uh, I want to also thank sort of, you know, sort of the Social Justice Institute for the invitation and then thank you all for coming um, and spending part of your afternoon here. There's, there's some seats over here if you want to sit down. Just like, I was like, people, in the, in, people sitting outside, so if you want to come on, sit down, there's some, there's some seats in front. Um, so as JP mentioned, today uh, I'm talking about something that's from a new book project that I'm calling Illegitimate Sounds. Uh, that's, that's the sort of title as it is right now, um, which are how I see the kind of bad objects and bad subjects of popular music. These are recordings that an artist who really refuse or fail to conform to normative logics of perceptibility and legibility and representation. So I'm interested in things like demos that are unfinished and incomplete and thus do not sit easily with capitalist demands that render and determine a song or a musical practice as proper and worthy enough to be commercially released, performed, or heard. They are viewed as inconsequential and very much illegitimate in relation to the final fish, finished and proper and subsequently commercially, uh, and, 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 sorry, and, and commercially released version of a song. But as I hope to argue in this project, they nonetheless produce their own kind of knowledges. Knowledges that I read as queer for how they express and embody impropriety. So it's with this discussion about impropriety that I now want to turn to Missy Elliott, and I want to talk about a performance that she had at the MTV Video Music Awards, not the one that she had last month uh, when she got the Video Vanguard Award, but one from 16 years ago. I was shocked to find out that it was 16 years ago. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, I'm going to play part of it. So uh, it's a performance, as you can see, with Madonna and Missy Elliott uh, and Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, the first almost two minutes uh, where Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera are performing like a virgin uh, and then Madonna pops up and then later and, and, and then and then later we get Missy. So I'm going to skip to this portion of it. I'm <laughs> sorry. 
stop it there. Um, I mean, we, we could, there's so many things happening. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm only going to hit on a few of them. Um, <laughs> it's so weird. Um, so scholarly and journalist kind of examinations generally talk about this performance through obviously the kiss between Spears and Aguilera and Madonna, mostly just between sort of Britney Spears and Madonna, or they focus on Missy Elliott's absence from the kissing scene and or the sexual touching of any of her, of any of her really sort of fellow kind of performers, and how that potentially evidences Missy Elliott's own closetness, given then, and, and especially now, the long-standing rumors of Elliott's ostensible really sort of lesbian identity. However, I want to read this scene differently, and I want to argue that these scholarly and journalistic ways of approaching queerness, that being the same-sex kiss or sexual touch, allied the other ways that Missy Elliott engages and inhabits and practices and produces queerness. We can, for one, look at Missy Elliott's sartorial style as gesturing toward an aesthetic of black female masculinity. But more to the point, I also see Missy Elliott as engaging in many queer acts of refusal. She enters the stage by exiting a chapel, the chapel being the alternative site to the more traditional and normative church. But also, unlike Madonna, who takes Spears and Aguilera as her brides, we find Missy Elliott leaving the chapel alone, merging perhaps as an African-American butch runaway, a fugitive, who refuses the normative really sort of futurity of marriage that's conceived in the kind of initial performance between Madonna and Spears and Aguilera. Furthermore, throughout this performance, Missy Elliott refuses to replicate the same kinds of couples dance that her fellow performers share. Indeed, she maintains a noticeable distance from Madonna as well as Britney Spears when they each respectively dance with her. It's a distance that, much like Jose Munoz's classic concept of queer ephemera, gestures toward but ultimately eludes a fixed and visible sexual touch, a kind of legibility through tactility. These acts of refusal, these queer acts of, these queer acts of refusal, as I'm trying to argue, are actually all set in motion through and around Missy Elliott's kind of musical forms of, 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 of really kind of refusal here. So Missy Elliott interrupts Madonna's performance of Hollywood and all of its attendant whiteness and normative uh, kinds of performance in order to stage her own 2002 hit song entitled Work It. It's in this break in the performance, this kind of rupture and violation of Madonna's white sonic performative schema that an acts and envelops Missy Elliott's subsequent black female queer acts and other kind of disruptive practices. Indeed, as Mecca Jamila Sullivan reads Missy Elliott's song, Work It, in particular Missy Elliott's notable use of rapping in reverse as a quote unquote sonic reconfiguration of backwards that, not, that, that really not only echoes the kinds of non-normative sexual practices like anal sex that Missy, that Missy Elliott describes and finds pleasure in in the song, but also how rapping backwards renders such lyrical black erotics unintelligible in ways that, quote, sidestep the, the, kind, of visual, the, kind, of, the kind of visual hegemonies of sexual surveillance, end quote, that attempt to pinpoint ones, and especially Missy Elliott's true and proper sexual orientation. And so it's here for me, it's here in Missy Elliott's own kind of impropriety and how she uses music and sound to disrupt the politics of visibility and visuality of racialized sexuality, that being black queerness, that I want to spend my time today on. I want to consider the ways in which Missy Elliott musically inhabits and expresses and produces queerness through a set of cultural practices that I'm referring to as the musical aesthetics of impropriety. So here I define the musical aesthetics of impropriety as performative expressions that are developed and deployed at the level of the sound recording, that being the lyrics and or the sound of a particular song or set of songs. Um, and, and, and these are these, these kinds of kind of performative expressions allow us to imagine and articulate queerness and hip hop differently. And that emerged through a sustained rejection and subversion of any and all means by which bodies and desires and pleasures and sexual practices become indicative of or register as visible and proper subjects. Which is to say the musical aesthetics of, of impropriety exploits the gaps and fissures of what qualifies as proper, as proper sexual subjects, that being LGBT, and how we come to perceive them as such, that being the evidence that informs such proper subject positions in order to produce a kind of alternative sexual and sonic formation. So what I'll talk about today are the kinds of, the kinds of impropriety that the musical, that, that, that really the musical aesthetics of impropriety embraces and engenders are the ones that fail to register as proper subjects, the methods that we use to define such proper subjects, and the respectable and proper norms governing such subjects. So the musical aesthetics of impropriety 
Don't simply seek to negate and all around ignore a visible and proper subject that is solely tethered to the stable categories of lesbian, gay, and bisexual or transgender. Rather, and more importantly, really the musical aesthetics of, of impropriety is an intersectional critique and practice and project of queerness. It's a queerness that is informed by and in conversation with Kathy Cohen's framework of queerness as, 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 in terms of queerness as deviance. Now, in rooting queerness in deviance, neither Kathy Cohen nor I am really trying to attempt to pathologize queerness or pathologize really blackness here. My aim is to instead make room for racialized people who, in cultural practices that, sit outside the heterosexual and homosexual norms that organize respectable and proper sexual forms of behavior. The kinds of deviance that Missy Elliott's own kind of musical aesthetics of, of, of really impropriety expresses involve engagements with erotic non-normative sexual desires and pleasures and practices that are rooted in a black feminist and queer of color and queer diasporic uh, kind of critique. It's a version of what hip hop feminist Joan Scholar calls pleasure politics, which trouble the racial, national, class, gender, and sexual politics or respectability that govern heteronormativity and homonormativity in black womanhood. So Missy Elliott uses a set of lyrical and sonic stylings that, to quote Joan Morgan, make room for, quote, honest bodies that also like to fuck, end quote. And I'll pause here and say, uh, I'm going to be cussing a lot in this talk, so this is not going to be the first time, uh, or it's not going to be the last time that you're going to hear me say the word fuck, just FYI. Uh, so <laughs> Missy Elliott is sexually explicit, as I just was. Um, she grunts, she moans, she locates pleasure within sexual practices deemed impure, those deemed improper, of really sort of under the normative logics of black, of black women's sexuality. And so I use the music of Missy Elliott as a case study through which we might envision a musical space of and engagements with black feminists and queer of color and sex positive informed practices of impropriety that will ultimately make audible alternative forms of queer formations. And these are queer formations that are not only cultural but also importantly really sort of political for me. Because as Kathy Cohen notes in, in very much her kind of assessment of deviance as queerness, we must think through how queerness is surveilled and regulated by the state. Indeed, as C. Riley Norton has argued, we should be cautious both within and outside the academy about exclusively praising and thus demanding the recent increase in representation of, of out black LGBT rappers. Now, really sort of Riley Norton is not saying that the representations of these rappers is necessarily bad. But he fears that such a sole focus on out LGBT rappers not only papers over those whose sexualities fall outside such categories, but more importantly and more to the point, uh, such an insistence on outness and visibility of and for black queer people runs the risk of exacerbating the cultural and legislative calls for greater surveillance and regulation of black bodies. This entanglement of visibility and surveillance is especially punitive for black queer people as it perpetually renders them really more vulnerable and to quote Jose Munoz, quote unquote, open to attack. So my focus on Missy Elliott and my advancement of the musical aesthetics of impropriety is an attempt to parry such attack and the politics of recognition that actually facilitates it. Indeed, my use of the musical aesthetics of impropriety is similar to, similar to Jose Munoz and Philip Bryan Harper's frameworks of queer, of, of queer ephemera and felt intuition who locate performances like cruising as really alternate modes of textuality and narrativity that produce queerness via, quote, traces and glimmers and residues and specks of things, end quote. And so to add another layer to my use of impropriety, the musical aesthetics of impropriety also lays claim to queers and especially black queer kind of potentiality outside the traditional evidentiary logic of, ver of verifiable hard and proper proof that often undergird attachments to the politics of recognition. So the musical aesthetics of impropriety then are much like Missy Elliott's dancing with Madonna and Britney Spears. They're indirect rather than, they're, 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 they're very much indirect rather than direct. They reflect a kind, of a, static, a kind of aesthetic strategy that kisses the surface, letting you know that something queer just happened and or is happening, but they don't leave enough, of, they don't need, leave enough evidence or trace to render that queer something visible or vulnerable, or, or, sorry, they don't, they, leave enough, uh, they don't leave enough evidence to render that queer, that queer something uh, that, that, that which is visible or vulnerable enough to warrant surveillance or regulation. Uh, and so what I want to do today is take you through a short journey of Missy Elliott's music and her performance of the musical aesthetics of impropriety. In particular, I want to focus on Missy Elliott's hit record entitled Get Your Freak On, which JP mentioned, and her 2002 hit song entitled Pussycat. 
These songs allow us to consider what the queer modalities of the musical aesthetics of impropriety might sound like. These songs highlight how a turn toward really musical aesthetics of impropriety can help produce critical queer opportunities and possibilities and new sets of knowledges that are routinely erased under the weight of liberal and positive frameworks of evidence and recognition. The goal here then is to search for and listen to what lies outside of what is legible to the greater registers of really perceptibility that organizes social life and especially black social life. And it's this process of listening differently, this search for alternative interpretive frames of virality, a different kind of queer hermeneutics of sound that will allow us to imagine our world and hopefully ourselves differently. So in the spring of 2001, really Missy Elliott released Get Your Freak On. And I want to analyze Get Your Freak On as a kind of exemplary case study of the, music, of the musical aesthetics of impropriety. To do so, I want to actually first focus on the category of the freak. Critical race, feminist, queer, and disability studies scholars compellingly articulate how scientific, medical, and colonial discourses produce the freak as a particularly marked, disabled, queer, and or race subject. For, and, 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 and to go even further, freak shows function as popular cultural expressions and reinscriptions of medical and imperial discourses of the freak. Freak shows use the circus cage as a site of spectacularization in which patrons could watch, gawk at corporeal differences, and consequently participate in a politics of looking that showed up really, that, that, that really sort of showed up forms of white supremacy and able-bodiedness and heteronormativity and U.S. imperialism. Importantly, though, the freak was and, and is also an erotic and very much eroticized body. The freak is, of course, freaky. Its purported perverse physical and visible body was assumed to be indicative of the kinds of sexual practices in which the freak participates. As Lamonda Horton Stallings notes, the freak has particular resonance in Afro-diasporic uh, peoples and culture for the ways in which it articulates racialized erotics. The broader U.S. popular imaginary portrayed and, still, and very much still portrays African Americans as, quote, otherly human, inhuman, or non-human, end quote, subjects who participate in deviant sex. Here we think we can think in cultural references of the freak that often mark black people as engaging in sexual behaviors that were really sort of promiscuous or anal or rough and very much in all other ways outside of the state sanctioned and morally kind of respectable forms of monogamy and penile vaginal sex of heteronormativity. The black freak thus was someone who really deserved state surveillance and regulation and containment. The music of Get Your Freak On indexes and sounds this queer and racialized and disabled history of the freak, but it does so in the service of the freak itself and not, and, and not rather the white and heteronormative and, and really able-bodied subject. Indeed, if, as Eli Clare has argued, circus freaks use their kind of objectified position to really disrupt the surveillance of the sideshow to reverse and restrict and make strange, in other words, to queer the white, the white kind of non-disabled male gaze, then I want to argue that Get Your Freak On participates in a similar practice of racially queering such politics of visibility and recognition. This proceeds through what we might call a black queer crip sound and develops a soundtrack for such improper forms of really sort of, of, of really sort of, uh, uh, such improper forms of really sort of, uh, of uh, missing a word, of really sort of, uh, forms of really sort of, uh, forms of objectification is what, what I was looking for here. So I want to play a, a brief clip of it, about a minute. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't listen to the whole thing. Um, we don't have enough time. But 
Uh, on the track, Missy Elliott and her production partner Timbaland participate in really a, a kind of promiscuous sampling aesthetics that draws on and features different kinds of Global South forms of instrumentation and voices. The song opens with a sample Japanese lyrical phrase and then moves into an interplay between the South Asian instruments of the tubla drum and the string tum tumbi. Here we find Timbaland and Missy Elliott also adding their signature quote unquote stutter step pattern of drums which is a drum programming technique that music critic Dave Tompkins describes as a perversion. That's, that's his quote, due to its rhythmic kind of deviations from dominant forms of really sort of drum, drum uh, kinds of patterns in rap music. And Elliot accompanies and amplifies these crip sounds of the stutter step with her own stuttering vocals, rapping sw sw Switch My Style in her first verse, and Getcha, 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 and, and, and then proceeds to say sort of Getcha, 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 Freak On in the chorus. These Afro-Asian voices, rhythms, and instrumentations, as well as the sonic stylings of disability, are multiple and very much multidirectional. They cross-cut and overlap and parallel each other. They often, they're often fleeting, as Missy Elliott and Timbaland bring such sounds in and out of the mix. They appear and disappear within and between spaces left by other instrumentation and rhythmic patterns. In this way, Get Your Freak On sonically raises the specter of the freak and its differing, and, and its differing histories along the lines of race and, and, of race and ability but it does so without collapsing those kinds of subjectivities. The track makes room for and highlights the intersections of these sounds and by extension their freakish histories without muting their own kind of distinctiveness. Here we find Missy Elliott and Timbaland achieving this by musically kind of creating many unexpected ruptures and silences which allow new sounds, new voices, new vocal textures and flows to enter and exit the kind of melodic and rhythmic kind of matrix of the song. If, as I noted earlier via Joan Morgan, that, that pleasure politics insist on making space for quote unquote bodies that also like to fuck, the Missy Elliott and Timbaland musically really create such an environment for those bodies as well as those freakish bodies. Indeed, really Grace Cho argues that gaps force us to develop quote radical new methods of looking in order to see something else, end quote. But I'm curious about what other kinds of senses. I think about interruptions really necessitate really sort of radical new, uh, and, uh, new kind of methods of listening as well. And Get Your Freak On is one such song that produces this critical kind of listening practice and one toward the queerness of the musical aesthetics of impropriety. For example, in the opening of the third verse, which I unfortunately can't play because of time, but you all probably know this, the music stops and Missy Elliott screams, quiet, and then she proceeds to say, hush your mouth, silence when I spit it out, end quote. The Missy Elliott then, then, then sort of simulates the coughing up of phlegm or some other kind of liquid and, and shoots it, quote, in your face and then proceeds, proceeds to say, open your mouth and give you a taste, end quote. Elliott's lyrics as well as vocal performance of spitting make, uh, make, make audible the, and visible the mixing of bodily fluids, raising the specter of contagion. Black bodies, Asian bodies, and disabled bodies, and queer bodies. These are all bodies that I'm arguing that Missy Elliott lyrically and sonically engages and expresses in Get Your Freak On are not only bodies that are deemed freaks, but also bodies that are deemed to be contagious. Scholars in critical ethnic queer and, 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 and performance studies have all detailed how various kinds of legislative and really juridical and medical and popular regimes have historically produced queer communities and immigrant communities and communities with disabilities and communities of color, and then, and then of course sort of communities that sit at these and other intersections, as contagious in order to shore up norms of race, gender, sexuality, and, and, and nation and ability. These freakish bodies were assumed to be biological and cultural threats who necessitated a kind of policing and surveillance due to their potential to spread and infect white, male-headed, heteronormative, and able-bodied people. It is, in this, it, is, it is in and against this historical backdrop of what we might call freak phobia that helps to explicate the queer and, I, and I'd argue radical queer kind of potentiality of Get Your Freak On. Rather than reject the label of the freak and offer a kind of redemptive narrative, rather than acquiesce to the politics of respectability and assuage difference, and thus be read as a, as a, as, as, as a legible liberal subject under the politics of inclusion, we find Missy Elliott desiring to infect. Here, Missy Elliott, a freak, actively spits, and again, maybe saliva, maybe blood, maybe semen, into the mouth and or onto the body of an unsuspecting and presumably uninfected person. And then proceeds to rap, quote, holla ain't no stopping me, copy written, so don't copy me, end quote. Here we find Missy Elliott reveling in her position as a black queer female freak and contagion, as a patient zero of sorts. She is the original that's being copied. 
The chant of now, uh, the chant of now go get your freak on during the song's chorus works as an anthem, a call to infect. Indeed, as, as, as to, to go back to really Wanda Horton Stallings, she rightly argues that there is often a, a slippage between freak and fuck within Afro-Diasporic culture, as the former is often a euphemism for the latter in, in black parlance. Here we think about euphemisms are those indirect gestures that, that express the invisible evidence of queerness. And so to get your freak on is to engage in a queer act of getting your fuck on. And so Missy Elliott's urging for the communal and infectious act of getting your freak on is actually an insistence to spread contagion through sex, through fucking. So the music of Get Your Freak On supports Missy Elliott's call for an infection. She and Timberland layer the kind of racialized, freakish Afro-Asian rhythms and instrumentations, as well as the crip sounds of the stutter step and Missy's own kinds of stuttering in such a way that they are really, very, really sort of really kind of overwhelming. There are so many sounds and instruments moving through and over and against one another and get your freak on that they feel as if they cannot be contained and must instead contaminate. It's here that Get Your Freak On operates as, po as a possible queer, queer world-making record. Its transnational, racialized, and crip sounds and lyrics seek to reproduce racialized freaks and queers. We find Missy Elliott in, in, in this alternative world-making vision on Get Your Freak On tie into a, a, another kind of euphemism for freak. To freak also means to mess, to play, to make strange, in other words, to queer. In her now classic study of hip hop and black feminism, Joan Morgan calls for women of color feminists who love and share erotic attachments to hip hop to quote, fuck with its grays, end quote. Gray is that middle ground between those visible spectrums of white and black, light and dark. Gray is also that murky, uncomfortable space of being neither here nor there, but somehow both. Gray does not fall decidedly on one side or the other. Gray is constantly in flux. The invasive and dynamic movement, this resistance to and negation of the stable and normative logics of sexual identification is what Missy Elliott engages in Grit Your Freak On. We find Missy Elliott does not, on, on the song, proclaim a non-normative erotic interest or encounters that we might typically read as queer. She does not explicitly, she, she does not explicitly discuss same-sex social relations, but she does scratch the surface of them. She deploys the musical aesthetics of impropriety to, to gesture through sound and instrumentation and lyrical euphemisms of queerness and queer relationality. We find Missy Elliott creating an improper queer soundscape on Get Your Freak On in ways that make space for the improper actors of the freak without providing the proper evidence of normative queerness. She would continue this, uh, she would continue this kind of practice in 2002 on a song entitled Pussycat. So now I'm going to play Pussycat. I'll skip. Two. Where? Oh. Oh, thank you. All right, I'm going to back it up. Unfortunately, again, can't play the whole thing. Uh, simply put, for those who couldn't tell, Pussycat is an R&B song that concerns Missy Elliott's ode to her vagina. In particular, how despite suggesting that heterosexual men have an affliction for cheating, that her pussycat has and is the cure. Now, there are a few things that I find to be odd and by extension queer about the song. There are three things especially that occur as breaks or gaps or spaces or silences in the song that further such queer feelings. I draw attention to such spaces of Pussycat because it is in these silences, and it actually is for me because of these silences, just as they were in terms of Get Your Freak On, that non kinds of reproductive and non-heteronormative joy and pleasure are expressed and experienced. 
The first occurs, and you didn't get a chance to hear this, near, near actually the end of the song, where the music stops. And Missy Elliott kind of initiates in some commentary about the song, and, and, and in particular, Elliott explains the reasoning behind the creation of the record. She notes, quote, weave, and here she means women, but I would argue, I would argue black women, been quiet for too long and ladylike and very patient. We always had to deal with these, with the, these guys saying that they were going to wear us out on records. So I had, to do some, I had to do records that was strictly representing for my ladies, end quote. Here, Missy Elliott rails against the politics of respectability that not only demands proper femininity as the ideal goal for all women, and again, I would, I would, I would make the argument black women here, but that also demands silence and the lack of sexual desire, essential tenets of such propriety. However, Missy Elliott's refusal to adhere to such norms of racialized gender on Pussycat does not result in the creation of a recording that simply attempts to really sort of flip the script, where Missy Elliott would then simply replicate a male rapper sexually, uh, 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 where, in, in, where, where sort of Missy Elliott would simply replicate a male rapper sexually addressing and pursuing an imagined woman, but doing so in, in kind of reverse and in, in, in really sort of reversing the gender roles here. She doesn't do that. Instead, what Missy Elliott decides to focus on her own sexual desires, practices, and pleasures, her own pussycat. In fact, Missy Elliott sings in the chorus, the typical, which is the typical centerpiece of popular music recordings, quote, pussy don't fail me now, I gotta turn this nigga out, end quote. Revealing that the song is neither about nor really addressed to men. Instead, Missy Elliott is quite literally directing her words and focus toward her pussy. Her main interest, both at the level of attention and subject of desire, is, is, is very much her vagina. Indeed, and this is the second silence that I want to briefly discuss, Missy Elliott's sonic sidelining of men in pursuit of her own pussycat deepen when we consider the song's edition of Missy Elliott's protege and rumored lover, Tweet, who unexpectedly begins singing back up prior to the song's bridge, so that's what you heard in the clip that I played. Tweet famously collaborated with, 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 with sort of Missy Elliott it was for the year prior to Pussycat on the song entitled Oops Oh My, a song about female masturbation and finding pleasure in one's body. And yet in both Oops and Pussycat, while seemingly two songs that are, that are only about solitary pleasure, they feature two women on the song, an act that refuses the solitary and moves toward the collective, where Tweed and Missy Elliott's vocals and positionalities and pleasures are in conversation and they very much overlap. Indeed, Tweet's backup vocals on Pussycat emerge in such a way that they, over, that they, they flow underneath and above and intersect uh, the, the, the kind of vocals by Missy Elliott. Tweet and Missy Elliott produce a dialogue, a kind of duet of sorts, really sort of during the chorus, that intertwine and overlap the kinds of positionalities and pleasures between them, and also sort of in relation to them, as well as their own Pussycats. When Missy Elliott provides a breathy moan during the chorus, Tweet issues a fully realized and vocally expressive coup that rises. When Missy Elliott grunts uh, during sort of the chorus, and it might mark a kind of delight in the pleasure that she finds in her own pussycat, Tweet, Tweet begins to rise her vocals, perhaps marking the climax, the end result, the orgasm of such pleasures. Tweet and Missy Elliott put the orgasm to task. They make it speak the name of their same-sex pleasure. Tweet not only amplifies Missy Elliott's erotic enjoyment in her vagina, but also, but also does so in ways that position them in close proximity and intimacy. It is the trace, the queer ephemera of this black female kind of erotic intimacy. It's here that Missy Elliott's male kind of significant other becomes further sort of the site through which Missy Elliott develops a stronger and more intimate kind of relationship with and to her vagina, as well as to tweet. But it would be perhaps wrong to assume that Missy Elliott's imagined male lover as fully excised from Pussycat. And this is the third and last gap that, uh, space that I want to discuss in terms of the song. Somewhat surprisingly or somewhat not, the start of the third verse features Missy Elliott and a male rapper, which you heard in the clip. However, this male rapper is actually not listed in the liner notes of Pussycat. It, it's a kind of omission that later speaks to what we would find out, is that the male rapper uh, really sort of doesn't actually exist. It's actually Missy Elliott herself. Here, Missy Elliott uses studio uh, kinds of software to pitch and slow down her voice in order to mimic the lower and deeper vocal registers that listeners perceive as male and would identify with heterosexual kind of rugged male masculinity. So Missy Elliott, in essence, creates a black male avatar and indexes following the work of Yuri McMillan the ways that black women performers have long used avatars to quote, to, to quote really sort of subvert the taken for granted rules of properly embodying a black female body, end quote. Importantly, sort of Missy Elliott does not use the avatar to boast about male uh, forms of sexual conquest or, or prowess. Instead, Missy Elliott's, Missy Elliott's kind of technologically mediated queer temporal break, 
Her sonic transition from one gender to another surprisingly is not used to express male interest in Missy Elliott's pussycat. He's, he's instead focused on another body part. He's, he's now focused on the ass. So Missy, Missy's own kind of male avatar notes in the third verse, quote, I wish we was like Puffy over Jennifer, him and her, so much like I and we. We just love the booty, end quote. Here we find Missy Elliott's avatar really producing what Jennifer Nash defines as black anality. A kind of, an, a, 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 it, it's very much a kind of analytic that describes, quote, how black pleasures are very much imagined to be particularly oriented toward the anus, end quote. The avatar uses the kind of relationship between Sean Puffy, now P. Diddy Combs, and Jennifer Lopez as a frame of reference for his relationship with Elliot. It marks the representational and material attachments of blackness and ass. The avatar roots his, sexual, his, his own kind of sexual relationship with Missy Elliot not in her pussy, but in his and her own anus. He uses the collective we to frame their shared and mutual jo joy of anal sex play. To which, to, to which sort of Missy later uh, talks and, say, and raps, quote, can I put my booty booty up in your spaghetti, daddy, end quote. So we find Missy Elliott's avatar becoming an object through which to express the musical aesthetics of impropriety. The avatar centers black anality as, non, as, as, non, as, really, as forms of really sort of non-reproductive and non-procreative and, and, and non, non sexual practices in ways that reject the logics of the politics of respectability that police black women's sexual behaviors as only proper and reproductive and, and involving penile and vaginal intersex. Sorry, and penile, penile and vaginal really sort of forms, forms of really intercourse, excuse me. So Missy Elliott's pursuit of a sonic avatar allows her to create and embrace alternative and improper imaginaries of sexual practices and pleasures that resist norms governing the proper erotics of black female masculinity. Pussycat as a whole then presents the possibilities of queer sex and eroticism through improper, uh, through sort of improper gestures and acts. She and her imagined male partner remain together. He's not going to cheat because it's actually her ass and not her pussy that, that sort of he very much uh, uh, likes and desires and fucks. Furthermore, such kind of black anality allows Missy Elliott and Tweet to further engage in black female sexual practices of communal forms of vaginal play and stimulation without producing the visual and proper proof of, of, of really a kind of sexual identity. Which is to say, Missy Elliott's collaboration with Tweet and her, and her own deployment of really avatar uh, kinds of aesthetics and pussycat claim and produce pleasure in and very much a desire for the erotic enjoyments of and in queer sex and, que and queerness. Produces knowledge about a black female queerness that centers and considers, as Kathy Cohen has powerfully argued, quote, the kinds of intimate relationships and sexual behaviors that are often portrayed as directly in conflict with normative assumptions of heterosexism, of heterosexism as well as a nuclear family, end quote. So by way of concluding, what I've attempted to do in this talk is explore what we miss when we solely look both in terms of visual analysis as well as dominant, nodes, uh, dominant, dominant modes of perception towards self-identified queer subjects and our kinds of approaches to queerness in hip hop. This is not an argument for the closet, nor very much is an attempt to push for scholarship on queer hip hop without, without LGBT subjects. Instead, I'm concerned with how we limit our studies of queerness and rap when our focus is very much constricted by and contained within very much the liberal politics of visibility and representation. Far too often, and especially for black people, and uh, we, we think about visibility becoming a site through which uh, black people are, 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 really sort of, are, are really sort of surveilled and policed. And so I want to push those of us invested in queerness and critical race theory and hip hop to consider alternative kinds of epistemologies of black queer forms of popular music. I offer what I call the musical aesthetics of impropriety as a way to expand such a discussion. The musical aesthetics of impropriety for me is a queer of color set of gestures and modes of critique that really resists and subverts the kinds of trappings around visibility in order to pursue the possibilities of the deviant and the improper. We must continue such intellectual pursuits and, and very much interrogate those kinds of improper expressions that always already disrupt and interrupt and make strange the kind of normative logics of, 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 of real sort of recognition here. Uh, to do so is to engage in a culturally and politically transformative act which allows us to imagine queer, queer hip hop and, and hopefully queerness differently. Thank you.
Yes. All right, I'll get the ball rolling. Hello. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Dina. Nice to meet you, Dina. So while listening to you, I, yes. I was having um, uh, you know a lot of things firing off, and, and one place maybe to start is to ask about uh, methodologies and temporalities. So I'm hearing uh, '90s and early OO methodologies coming out of queer studies and queer theory mm -hmm. um, that we've been told are um, too self-indulgent sometimes and we're not to use those anymore and we can't use the word normative and you, you, you know what I'm... I do. You, okay. <laughs> so, it was a breath of fresh air <laughs> to hear someone analyzing texts like this in ways that are enlivening and, and playing on those quote-unquote traditions. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is really just to invite you to, to, to share with us some, some responses to the idea that the no future argument seems to infinitely have a future. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that there seems to have been always a future in the kind of queer theoretical reflections on, on media, on address, on the displacement. Um, stepping aside, the stutter, the stutter uh, step that you referenced, you know, mm -hmm. syncopation as queer modalities that have been uh, present and ongoing in a number of cultural sites for at least 200 years. Mm -hmm. Like, I would say more, but anyway. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for, for that question. It's a great question. Um, I mean, it, the, so... I'm trying to figure out the best route. Yeah, and so part of what's happening um, as the way I'm, I'm kind of imagining it in this new project is um, really influenced by Jose Munoz's notion of the sort of queer uh, forms of ephemera. Um, and th thinking about traces and glimpses um, as particularly kind of modalities of queerness, but especially uh, when it comes to queers of color. And um, part of that own kind of attachment is it seems to me, uh, at least in popular music studies uh, more broadly, a kind of skipping over of notions of queer ephemera. Right? So for me, uh, there's a lot of scholarship, and this is not a kind, this is not at, 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 at sort of any way I'm saying all the scholarship, but scholarship, especially dealing with queer hip hop. Um, there is this understanding that in order to talk about queer hip hop, we must have a out queer subject, or we might we must study a queer kind of community, a, a already self sort of declarative queer kind of community. And for me, uh, this is partly why I want to talk about Missy Elliott, and part of part of my own kind of understanding about Missy Elliott, right, is someone who has never actually come out, right. And yet, for me, there, there's so much richness in how we can understand Missy Elliott as a particular kind of black female queerness, as, do, as doing a kind of black queer work. And part of the reason why I, I obviously want to kind of focus on, 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 on this kind of uh, framework of, about black queerness is, I think, um, part of what was also happening in, the, in some of the critiques about, in, in, in about 90s and, and, and early 2000s forms of queer theory, right, is that there wasn't necessarily uh, a kind of uh, sort of understanding of queerness in relation to race, right? And so part of me is, is, is going with stuff by sort of Rod Ferguson and Martin Menelanson and, and uh, and Guy Tregopinoth, right, about how we can sort of complicate these early formations, right, in a way that, uh, that, that, that's very attentive to how race and gender and disability are very much at play here. So for me, in thinking about Missy Elliott, not only in terms of Missy Elliott in 2002, 2003, but also we could think about Missy Elliott now, is still very much involved, in a, for, for me, in a kind of black queer kind of, kinds of sort of, kinds of really sort of world making here. Right? And so I, part of the reason why I wanted to end with, with this picture that was taken um, about four or five years ago is that she's wearing a hat that has Banji on the front, which is coming out of the queer kind of black and, Latin, and really Latinx kind of ball scene here, right? And how this, she's kind of particularly sort of signaling her own kind of instantiation, her own kind of manifestation and work within a kind of black and Latinx forms of queerness.
right? And how for, for me, again, there's a kind of wink, wink, nod, nod, this kind of thing that I don't, I'm not going to kind of fully declare, but I'm going to dance, I'm going to touch, I'm going to kiss, right? This is, for me, the kind of importance of understanding, uh, the, for me, the radical queerness that Missy Elliott really sort of engages in. So, thank you. Other questions? JP? Question. Uh, okay. I was wondering if I could get you to say a bit more about <clears throat> gossip slash rumor slash speculation. Yes. As it's uh, which you begin with yeah. in your talk um, as their own kinds of world making. Uh, right. Um, uh, as their own kinds of knowledge production. Right. Um, sorry. Again, um, this comes out of Jose Munoz's and queer ephemera, right? I mean, and I, it's, it's, it, it's in part for, for me, I should say, that I went to grad school um, at NYU, and um, sort of Jose was uh, really kind of central to my work when I was taking sort of courses in grad work. And, uh, and, and that article has always kind of stuck with me, despite it being from 1996, 1997, um, and, and, how sort of home, and, and how sort of Jose Munoz is trying to uh, push um, a particular kind of understanding of queerness that's uh, not involved um, in, in, in only being about sort of rigor and hard evidence, right? So the way that, 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 that Jose is trying to kind of play and, and think about how do we think about queer evidence, right? As not, excuse me, as not simply being hard and proper proof, but how and how queer, queer people of color especially Talk, of, talk about queer kind of celebrities, talk about rumor. Rumor becomes a particular kind of sort of communicative uh, practice, right, of queerness, right? Uh, and it produces its own kind of thing. Uh, Missy Elliott, of course, um, had a song in 2002 entitled Gossip Folks. Uh, where she talks about all this gossip surrounding her. And in the opening of that song, uh, she mentions uh, that there are rumors that uh, she was quote unquote fucking with Tim, that being Timbaland, her, her longtime kind of production partner, and then started fucking with Trina, Trina being a black female rapper. And what has always interested me in, in how Missy Elliott is, is, is using that song in terms of gossip folks is that she acknowledges that these rumors exist, right? But does not say, no, these are, th this is untrue, and she never claims them to be true, but she wades and revels in the space of gossip, right? She wades and revels in these things without a kind of proper kind of evidence of any kind of thing, right? And for me, what does it mean to kind of stay and live within rumor? What does it mean to take rumor seriously as a particular kind of queer gesture? Right, again, um, a, a gesture versus a kind of declarative statement, right? Something that uh, you can't necessarily put your finger on, but you kind of suspect that it's, it's there. Uh, so I'm really kind of interested in these particular kind of acts that Missy Elliott, I feel, to be engaging in. Thanks. Yeah, Janice. So there's this crappy show that was on TV, I don't know if you've seen it, American Horror, and there's this one <laughs> called Carnival. Yes. And there's a, a, an excellent little scene in one of the episodes where people are saying, I'm a freak, mm -hmm. but I'm not a monster. Hmm. So you have this kind of relegation to uh. kind of the spectral, what's haunting the margins anyways, and then these distinctions. I'm interested in your use of kind of reclaiming as a kind of a queer space this idea of the freak and how you're reading it being used by Miss Elliott, if you could say a little bit more about the freak. I, I can I can totally say a lot about being the freak. Um, I haven't seen American Horror Story. Um, so good. I, all right, <laughs> I you know, well, I was gonna say, like like most people, they have a very complicated relationship with Ryan Murphy, um, and so it's just one of these things where I was like, am I gonna get into it? Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Actually, start watching it. Right? There's some Ryan Murphy things that I watch and hate watch, perhaps, um, as it may. Um, yeah. So uh, part of part of this is it, for me is trying to, especially in, in something like Get Your Freak On, but more broadly in terms of my work, um, how do we take these kinds of fields of study that seem to be very sort of disparate, right? Uh, we think about disability studies, we think about queer studies, we, we think about critical race studies, right? 
have all written about the freak in some particular kind of way. Um, and for, for me, as a kind of interdisciplinary scholar, but also you know, a scholar of queer studies, very much interested in uh, these kinds of intersections, I'm very much interested, how do we put these things together, right? And Missy Elliott and Get Your Freak On became that particular kind of way, right? Uh, the, the kind of use of, again, uh, sort of Afro-diasporic and South Asian uh, kinds of instrumentation, uh, the kinds of use of the stutter, right? Those kinds of things that I'm like, all right, how is she kind of deploying the freak at these multiple levels, lyrically and sonically, how is this working out? And again, for me, it's also about not necessarily um, shying away or wanting to kind of disavow the freak, right? Not, uh, to, but to actually find uh, the freak as a site of kind of resistance. Not only for me is this in conversation with Kathy Cohen's notion of queerness, of, 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 of queerness and deviance, but also, as I mentioned, Eli Clare writing about freaks. And, and, and Clare especially um, has a particular kind of passage that basically says, I know it's weird uh, for me as a disabled person to want to kind of reclaim the freak in this, at this particular moment in time, but I feel as if the freak does this particular kind of work. That, um, that, that, that the freak is like a particular kind of oppositional uh, figure within, within sort of disability studies that, that for Claire wanting to kind of um, um, push and claim um, and think about the freak in these other kinds of ways that make people feel uncomfortable, but for Claire it's like this is a good thing to be uncomfortable, right? Uh, it's a good thing to kind of wade in, 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 in this particular kind of space. And so for me, thinking about Missy Elliott, how, again, uh, this is the phrase of now, 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 the phrase of really sort of now go get your freak on, is this for, for me a kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's inciting, right? It's inciting something, right? Because she's telling, now go, you fellow freaks, get your freak on, right? And I mentioned, right, the kind of slippage between freak and fuck. There's this kind of thing to kind of make more freaks that I find to be really, really interesting here. And even in the music video, um, which obviously I didn't have time to kind of talk about, right, are filled with these other kinds of freaks. Right? People whose heads are coming off, people who, who, who have these stone-like faces. Right? So this is a whole kind of, and literally it's underground, a whole kind of underground population of freaks. Right? And so I find this to be a really kind of fascinating thing that Missy Elliott is engaging in, in terms of how we might kind of think about the, this, this kind of figure of the freak that signals, for me, sort of really black studies, it signals, it signals queer studies, it signals sort of disability studies, all these other kinds of studies that, for me, Missy Elliott's putting them together in some really interesting ways. Oh, thank you. Yes? Um, I have a question. I think it's about like um, studies in pop culture and pop music. Okay. I think when I heard the song, I felt immediate, like Get Your Freak On, I'm immediately transported back to, to like a high school dance. And mm -hmm. It's 2003 and I live in a suburb of Montreal. And right. There's all these like awkward 15 year olds dancing <laughs> to the song. And I think it's just making me think about its status sort of within the Billboard 100, mm -hmm. and, you know, Grammys, it's like, it, it was so ubiquitous in the mid-2000s. And so how do we read like such a subversive form that is refusing visibility and legibility in so many ways, but is also kind of being distributed within these very normative channels of the kind of enterprise of pop music and pop culture? It's a great question. So, yeah. um, and, and, and to be honest, uh, this is part of the reason why um, I wanted to talk about Get Your Freak On, and part of the reason why I wanted to uh, open with Missy Elliott doing Work It um, is that it's especially at these moments when Missy is so visible, right? And there's so much um, attention that's being played to her that I'm interested in terms of how, how she's actually responding to this moment and her queerness, right? These queer rumors have existed prior to her actually becoming big. But Get Your Freak On is that moment. Work It is that moment when everyone is paying it. It becomes a crossover moment. She, she'd never been no nominated for a Grammy until actually Get Your Freak On. Right? This is, that's her third album. That's happening on her third album. And so I'm very much interested in, in pointing to these kind of crucial moments when all the attention is on her, all the kind of visibility is on her, and therefore there seems to be this understanding that this is now the critical moment to perhaps come out, or this is now the kind of critical moment uh, to kind of um, identify in particular kind of stable and proper category, and Messi Elliott refuses to do so. Right? And that, that for me becomes this really kind of fascinating moment. Right? She could obviously do it now if she wanted to, um, 
but I'm really interested in that moment when she's most visible and how she's working with and against that own kind of visuality and visibility, right? So thinking about sort of Get Your Freak On as a song that was actually the last recorded song off of that album, um, to, to, to do this is, is really kind of remarkable. Um, and I should, I should also point out um, that after sort of Get Your Freak On, I talked about tweet, tweet songs through Oops Oh My, but she also did a song with, really, with, with, uh, with uh, sort of Michelle um, Indegio Cello called Pocketbook. Uh, so, so she and Tweet did a remix of Pocketbook and Michelle Indigo Cello, of course, being another black queer artist, Pocketbook being another kind of euphemism for actually vagina. And yet, so they're all kind of waiting in this space of queerness, right? Without, and this is happening in 2002, again, at the height of all of their careers, waiting in the space around sort of black female queerness, but never actually sort of declaring something. And I'm really kind of fascinated by, the, by these kinds of sort of, um, sort of differences and textures involved in that. Right. That helps, yeah. Uh, we need to end because oh. there is a graduate seminar happening right at 1 o'clock. Oh, is it going? Um, OK. Sorry about that. Uh, so I invite folks to uh, say hello after, uh, very quickly, <laughs> <laughs> as, we, as we reconfigure the room for the seminar. But let's thank uh, Elliot uh, for the Thank you. Thank you.